Hello and welcome back to a very COVID-riddled episode of the Busby Way podcast. Not that we've got COVID, just the Premier League and Man United seem to have it. How are you, Chris? Yeah, well, luckily, no COVID yet. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, <it's> <laughs> I think, yeah, it's probably the optimum word, isn't it? Where yeah. life's going at the minute. But yeah, uh, all good. Is I think uh, we're in for a, a strange podcast, considering we've not got anything to talk yeah. about this, actually a uh, positive other than the uh, COVID results. Well, I mean, yeah, like you say, the only positive things coming out of this is the testing. Um, yeah. <laughs> look, cause let's be realistic. I mean, United haven't had a game since we last did a podcast. Both the Brentford game and the Brighton game got postponed, which is a shame. Um, it's a shame for, you know, United fans. It feels like an age since we've played, actually. Yeah. I, I, when was the last game? Was it Young Boys? Yeah. Oh, it was no, feel... Norwich. It was Norwich. Wasn't oh, Norwich. It? Yes, yeah. it was Norwich. Yeah, and that for me feels like a lifetime ago. It feels like mm. so long ago that we played Norwich. It's it's bizarre, but anyway, it wasn't. It was only last weekend, <laughs> but it, it does feel like a long time ago. Um, we'll start with the COVID stuff then, because obviously that's the main thing on the the agenda, and it's probably one of the only things on the agenda really. It's it's caused a lot of games to be called off this week, such as the United ones and Tottenham have had a few called off. Um, and poor Leeds are the only ones that haven't, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Got the world's smallest violin playing out for you there. <laughs> um, due to the injuries they've got, um, they wish they had their games called off, but they didn't. Um, also, Chelsea struggling with COVID quite a lot, but I find it bizarre that they, they requested to have their game called off, and yet it was that rejected. Person- yeah, and well, I think all you have to do is look at the uh, eleven they put out. Yeah, they did. Like, come on, it was the first team. Yeah, they had put two keepers on the bench. But you mentioned Leeds. Um, mm. I was actually w- working on the game, and oh yeah, their bench was funny because yeah. honestly, I don't think any of them had sat an A level. No, they were that young, and like, but and when you get Chel- a club like Chelsea going, oh yeah, we we don't have enough players, but we're still gonna name. Um, a World Cup finalist on our bench, a Champions League winner on our bench, and uh, Ross Barkley, who's you know got a good couple hundred appearances in the Premier League. And it's like, eh, come on, lads, you know, you're, stre- you're stretching it a wee bit here. It's not like you've got a lot of kids on the bench, let alone in the starting 11, like teams like Leeds. So, yes, so, some clubs have had it bad. I think some of, I wonder how many of, um, Got a few convenient injuries to hit the um the cut off point so that they don't actually have enough players. Um, you know what I mean? So but ultimately, yeah, it's a situation now where it's difficult in it. Um it's spreading quickly. Um I think you said just before we came on earth that they've recorded 90 cases across the Premier League in the last round of testing. Yeah, it, it's the record amount. Last week's was the uh, was the record and it, it's double last week's. So it's it's absolutely smashed the record out of the park. Um, it literally just come through before we came on air. It came through on Sky Sports on my phone. Um, I am just checking it now. There's notifications are coming through to check. It's not Sky Sports, anything more about it. But they had a meeting today, apparently the Premier League, and have determined that they will not be taking a stopgap break and they will be continuing with the congested Christmas fixture list. Um, do you think that's the right idea, Chris? Or do you think they'll end up having to call it off anyway? I'd be amazed if we have a full round of fixtures, put it that way. Um, I can see at least two or three come off purely because of the fact that um, surely all these play these all these players who have tested positive will still be unavailable because of the um, isolation periods. So logically, um, you know, a lot of them won't be able to play if they if their tests have caused them to miss the last round of fixtures. So wipe them out for this one. I just. It, yeah, I just I, f- I find it bizarre that they've not gone. You know what? There's a situation here. It's not good if back to back game weeks we have three or four fixtures because of the backlog we're going to have in 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 the new year. Um, and especially when you think that they're not going to have time off really in between the seasons because they've been brought forward because of the World Cup. Um, so it, it's a very difficult situation and. Um, I have seen that they're scrapping third and fourth round FA Cup replays to potentially help out, but it's you know it's not a 
a guarantee shift of fixture is you know um it's, it's, it's only the rare occasion you do get the draw in the fa cup anyway so um i don't think that that really makes that much of a difference um because realistically most of the premier league sides who haven't drawn each other um will get past the fourth round anyway so um yeah he's gonna he's gonna get messy i think um like i said i i can't see us having a full round of fixtures again um this game week um i, I think it could well be the case for the next few game weeks where there's at least one or two um it gets called off in, until the sort of situation um nationally and even globally sort of calms down a bit um which obviously we hope it does soon yeah, definitely. Um, and it came out this week as well that the vaccination rates of Premier League players are considerably lower than other leagues. I don't have the stats to hand, but I saw the stats on social media flying about that. You know, a lot of a lot of clubs um, in I think the Serie A and the league or in the um, Bundesliga, I think it was them three leagues were very highly vaccinated compared to ours. And it came out today um, during that meeting that they've announced that 84% of players are on their vaccination journey, in quotation marks. Now, what that means, who knows? Um, I'm obviously not asking you here, Chris, to give you political views on the vaccinations. Obviously, I feel like everyone has the right to choose what they want to do. They shouldn't be forced upon people, but they should definitely consider the vaccine. Do you think it's... It's something that people of that high sporting stature should almost take as a bit of a more of a responsibility to educate themselves on the vaccine and make a, uh, an informed decision on whether to take it or not. Or do you think? Do you think more players should be taking it? I think, um, yeah, like you say, everyone also has the choice as to whether they do or don't have the vaccine. That is a belief I hold as well. Um, I personally have chosen to have it, for example. Um, I can understand why sports people could be sceptical because of the impact it could have on the performance. But then what I would say is COVID will have a big impact on your performance. Mm. Not two ways about it. From, you know, um, stopping you playing for a, for a fortnight to, you know, oh, potentially a lot, lot worse. Um, so well, Dean Henderson got it bad, didn't he? And he... Yeah. A few have got it bad. Uh, I know Carl G Darlow, the backup keeper at Newcastle, he had it bad, and he he said he was like fearful for his life. Um, and it, he's one who's since gone and got vaccinated, I believe. So it's I understand that these sports people now, especially with all the sports science, they look after the body impeccably. So by you know having something, a vaccine that, yeah, there isn't a lot of history to its science um, because it is new, but it's had to be quickly done because this virus wasn't around two years ago. So, yeah, you, you can understand why they might think, oh, I don't know, because it might affect my performance, it might affect this, it might affect that. Um, yeah, understandable. But... The environment you work in as well is um, is one um, where you probably you are quite likely to to get it because you're in close contact with your teammates, close contact with opposition players. Yes, you're outside, but even so, um, and you're coming into contact with a lot of people throughout the season, um, both for your club team and internationally as well potentially. So, I think maybe there should have been a bit more education given to the footballers um about you know the impact it could have on on your performance but also dispelling any myths around it because there might not be any thing about your performance yeah i, I know when for example i i'm a booster the, the other day and you know the friday i felt awful um but the day after that i was i was fine players might be reluctant to have a have their jab close to a game because they might rule them out of a game but in the wider context to me, the benefits outweigh the negatives. So it, it is an interesting one. Um, I do I do think, though, that I think the figures are quite stark when you compare it to 
the general population. I think the general population of vaccine uptake is pretty high, but like I think the EFL across the EFL, I think there was only I think twenty five percent of players said they weren't going to get vaccinated. Obviously, religious beliefs and, and stuff will come into that health, etc. Um, which obviously you do have to take into account. But I thought it was quite a quite a high number um, of, of players saying they probably wouldn't get the vaccine. So I, d I don't think clubs should force it upon them. I do think, though, clubs and probably the FA more so probably need to better educate the players and, and help them make the right decision and not buy into any myths or... Um, untruths maybe yeah 100 percent agree i think i think you summed it up pretty well there actually um yeah but probably couldn't have said it about myself the we know the way it is with a vaccination role like yes the education needs to be there i think for people because i think a lot of people it's very easy to get a, a preconceived idea about something nowadays especially given social media and the way it can spiral out of control you know it's very easy for a rumor to spread that isn't true and for something to spread that perhaps isn't factually proven um, about certain things, not just about the vaccine, but you know, anything in general, it, it's very easy for conspiracy theories to, to spiral. Um, so that, that education, I think, from a, from a reliable source is, is necessary, I think, not just within sport, but I think in, in general life, I think in schools, kids should be brought up in, in lessons, being taught like life skills and, and stuff like Obviously, not to be, believe everything they read on the internet and everything like that. that, that but that's a whole whole another kettle of fish to get into. But in terms of the vaccine, yeah, I think I think you're right. I think the I think it was 25. percent I remember doing reading now actually that the um, 25 percent of the EFL weren't going to take it, which is a damning damning statistic. Um, and I think a lot of people um, need to read up on on why the vaccine is important. Um, I do get why people don't want to take it, and I also get why people want to take it. And like you say, like myself, I've chosen to take it, and I've also had my booster. So you know, it's I'm I, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. The vaccine, it's a, it's a sticky topic because it's very divided and it's very opinionated. And no matter what you say, you're going to upset people. So you, you know, unfortunately, the, I think the Premier League are trying to do their best. Um, but we will soon see in the coming weeks whether the league does carry on. But if it does carry on, not on Boxing Day this year, which I find um, highly, highly aggravating because I love Boxing Day football. Mm. Um, love watching my team play on Boxing Day. It's probably the best bit about Boxing Day. And we are the only game not to be <laughs> on it this year, which is so frustrating. We play on the 27th of no uh, December against Newcastle. Now, previewing this game seems a bit strange because... We haven't played in two games, so we don't know who's injured, we don't know who's fit, we don't know who's got COVID. But it's it's Newcastle. We'll talk about Newcastle a bit. Um they they haven't had the best season, Newcastle. That they've they've stumbled, they got battered in the week against at City, um, and they're and they're struggling. And to say they're the richest club in world football, they're not showing it in the league. Um and thankfully we're getting them before January, before they go out and absolutely spend loads to keep them in the Premier League. How do you think we'll fare, Chris, against Newcastle? Do you think we'll do, you think we'll do well? Or? I think whenever we go to St. James's, it's, it, you know, it's a bit, it's a big, big game for them. Um, I think other than when they have their derbies against Sunderland, their games against United are, are the ones, really. Um, I think it goes back to those uh, battle, battles in the 90s uh, where it was tussle for the title um you know i'd love it if we beat them and all that um so there is a there is a big rivalry there um and obviously they've got a half decent record um they've beaten us a, a couple of times in recent years um was it long staff who scored um to beat us one nil i think i think i'm right in saying the last three games newcastle have beaten us at st james's have all been by a one nil score line um Remember, a year they beat us 3 0, where Denver Baron Kabai scored good goals. Obviously, it was the 5 0 in 96. But, um, you know, we we also have a decent record there. But usually, when we lose, we, we get either spanked or we play awfully. Um, which, to be fair, is probably about par for United. Um, yeah, I, I think it's one of those that 
if we start well and get an early goal, we win the game. Because uh, they don't look like a team to me who can come from behind right now. Because I think they're scared to go at teams because they're so bad defensively. Their back, li their back line is a championship team. And I won't, e I won't even say it's a top six championship back line, in all honesty. Um, Kevin Clark, man, he's, he's pretty poor. Um, uh, yeah, the, 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 back, the back four and he's dodgy. The goalkeeper's got an error in him as well, but can pull out a world. He's, he's a bit of a strange one. But I think going forward, they're actually a bit of a threat. Joe Linton's turned into an absolute machine. Um, in recent weeks, he's looking, he's turned into a midfielder. And he's, he hmm. should have signed him as a midfielder instead of Fred. Um, <laughs> and then obviously, they've got Sam Maximan, who's just a live way. I love watching him play. Um, just misses a bit of end product sometimes. Um, but then they've got Callum Wilson down the middle, who I think, considering where they are, I think he's got six or seven goals this season. Mm -hmm. It's a good return that for a team that's right down there and don't really attack. Um, they, they're a bit more proactive now under Eddie Howe, but they have had a couple of difficult games. They've either played teams around them or teams right up near the top, so they've been a bit unlucky in, in that regard. Um, it's a big game for them in, in every sense, I think, and I think they'll they'll go at us because I think they'll see vulnerabilities. Um, but like I say, I think if United, if Manchester United can get that first goal, we can score first. I don't see Newcastle having the ability to come back and certainly come back and win the game. Um, and I think you know if we can score first, we can get a second and a third really with the quality that we possess as well. So, will will be an interesting game, I think, um, to see if we can get an early goal. Um, obviously, they gifted City an early goal at the weekend, which sort of set the platform. Because um, I didn't think City were particularly good. Um, I thought they were a bit sloppy for 20 minutes and still were two up. Um, oh, and don't get me started on that penalty that <laughs> where Edison just flattened Fraser. Um, but yeah, the, it, it's a fixture that I, I think has a rich history and has potential to be a good game. Um, I, it's cliche, but First goal's massive. First goal's massive. If, if we can get it, we go and win for me. Yeah, and Callum Wilson, like you say, has got six goals this season, so he is one to watch um, coming up against. I'm just going to do a quick change over here because we're going to go into a bit more of a broader topic. So we're going to put the snow on <laughs> because it's Christmas time, ladies and gentlemen. It is, <laughs> it's Christmas time in Manchester. It's cold. The snow's coming. Um, it's basically, I just wanted to do this little section of the podcast to look forward um, to potentially after Christmas, because I think this is one of the last ones we are doing before the new year. Um, so there's a few topics in here that I want to talk about that are more broader and more looking towards the future United. So, for example, like one of them here, which we'll start with, when you will finish this season, Chris? Are you, are you hopeful? Are you... Do you think we've got a chance of getting that top four now Ragnit's come in? Or do you think we might just scrape scrape the Europa League place? I'm going to be very bold here. I think mm. third's up for grabs again. Do you I know really what? Me, me and my dad were saying the exact same thing yesterday. When Chelsea dropped points yeah. again for the second week running, I think Chelsea are going to slowly fall away. Um, I know there were a lot of people's favourites to start the league. But yeah, I think that third place is up for grabs. Go on what you were saying. And I think as well... What we touched on earlier with them um, with them trying to get the game called off for COVID. I think I think that's a sign that they're so they know they've hit a rut mm. and they want to have that break to to regroup. Mm. So I think that they're there to be caught. Um but what I'd say is it's competitive behind in and around us as well. You've got um so West Ham have, have dropped off a little bit, um, but they're still like, in the mix and still capable. Arsenal have, have started to show good signs, but I think we're in a position where we can strike. If we can go on a run like we have done in the past, fourth is certainly there. Third isn't beyond the realms of possibility if Chelsea don't pick up. Um, so yeah, I, I, I cer certainly think Champions League is a bare minimum we we should get. Um, because I, I, I still think a worse with the fourth best 
team that I, I still think that on paper were better than Arsenal, were better than West Ham. It's all about the consistency. Whoever's the most consistent ultimately is going to get in in that. I think United have the better foundations um, mm -hmm. and a better run of fixtures now. They've seen obviously they've got the majority of the big hitters um out the way at least first time around. So um and we've got these nice run of fixtures over the next month or so, haven't we? So mm -hmm. we've got got made the most of that. I think in a month's time it'd be easy to answer that question. Yeah. But yeah, if I would I would cautiously say fourth. Um but I like I said, I, I think third could be could be a possibility if we have a really good month or so. Yeah, and, and it's been a reoccurring theme, hasn't it, in the past few seasons where that fourth place has just been about the most consistent team. So many people, uh, sorry, people, teams around that place, for example, like United, Tottenham, I can't remember, or Leicester, wasn't it? It was Leicester in and about that time when they were just, no one seemed to want that Champions League place. I remember the, there was that time at the end of last season when everyone was just dropping points. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. I think... I think fourth you should be getting. I think you'd be very disappointed if you didn't because, like you say, they're better than Arsenal. On paper, they're probably better than West Ham. Tottenham are there and thereabouts. It depends how Conte gets them playing over the next mm -hmm. few weeks. I know he, they had a good result against Liverpool. Um, it just it just purely depends on that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think I'd be very disappointed if we didn't get fourth this season. Moving on then, next question. If... Manchester United were to have a New Year's resolution based on these last 12 months, and let's be honest, they've been a pretty dreary 12 months. What would you say that resolution is? Learn how to defend. <laughs> you have to be very frank about it, yeah. Because yeah, I think that that's been the big the big one, especially this season. Um, mm. I mean, it stretches back a long time because they went a long time without a clean sheet. And then obviously, I mean... To caveat this, Ralph has come in and got us a couple of um, clean sheets um, mm -hmm. in the last few games, um, which maybe turns a corner. But then when you look at it, they come against Crystal Palace at home and Norwich away. Um, and and then the other, maybe you could also say it would be to get better results against the better teams, um, mm -hmm. especially away from home. I think other than the Chelsea result, we struggle away from home um, to the to the so-called bigger teams um yeah i think in a combination of, of the two um yeah because i think now the ranyuk's come in we have started to address that first one i think um and it will be interesting to see how that transpires into the taking on the, the bigger boys um side mm -hmm. of things as well yeah for me i think it's probably I know it's going to sound very broad, but it's to establish the style of football. Yeah. I think we, last season, we, under Ole, yes, there was glimmers and there was times where we did show our style and we, we were good. I mean, especially, I want to mention that Tottenham when it, when Ole, in one of Ole's last games, when we went to Tottenham and we, and we mm -hmm. grinded out that result. That was a very nice tactical way of winning a game of football for once, rather than just going hell for leather and absolutely trying to uh, attack teams out the water with no way or formation. You know, no no one really knew where they were playing and what their roles were. I remember we said countless times on this podcast this year, what type of midfielder is Fred and what type of midfielder is McTominay? And I feel like under Ragnick already in these last few games, we've already seen that. I feel like we've already seen the better version of Fred. All right, we've had our, our, our says about Fred on this mm. podcast, but... He's been better than he has been um, earlier on this year. Same with McTominay. Um, yeah, I, I think it's to establish that style of football. If you can get that 4-2-2-2 playing, which is what Ragnick seems to be going with, you can establish your pressing style of football better than what we did under Rolly. Um, because at least that way... We've got an identity. I think they need to move away from that old Man United DNA. And I know it's good to have that in glimmers, but not just to focus on that solely because no one's going to replicate what Fergie did. I'm not being funny. No one, no manager around nowadays is Sir Alex Ferguson. So they need to come in with that United DNA, but with their fresh ideas. And I think that's what Ragnick's done um, in the last few weeks. So I'm, I'm looking forward to 2022. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. And then finally... This is quite an interesting one because we got everyone we wanted and more in the summer. 
But who would you like to see Manchester United sign in January? It'd be a midfielder, mm -hmm. but it's who? Yeah. Um, because like, because the thing is now we sort of changed our our style, mm -hmm. and we're sort of trying to think who now fits this style. Um, I mean, one sort of one player I really liked when he, I think he actually played under Ranić at, at Leipzig or was certainly there when Ranić was either coach or higher up was um, Sabitzer. Yeah. Um, central midfield. I think he's now at Bayern. Yeah, he is. But I don't, I, I can't claim to watch a lot of Bayern Munich to be honest. Um, but I don't, I don't hear him, people talk about him. I always really rated him. Um, so maybe we might see somebody who's a bit of a wild card, um, in some respects, as, as in, you know, he's not like the household central midfield player, mm -hmm. but Ranić knows how. How to play him? How to get out the best out of him? Because he was out, he was outstanding for Leipzig. Well, there's that um, talks of that high Dara, isn't there coming in? There's there's yeah. been a few murmurs of him, and I, and personally, I've not seen anything of him. I, I couldn't tell you what he was like, where he played, or what number he wore. Um, but I mean, it, you've got to trust Ragnik because if it's someone who he's coached before, and like you say, who he knows he can get fit into that system. I think you've got to trust it. Um, yeah, like you say, I think United need to move away from that household name thing. It hasn't worked over yeah. the last few years. It's it's just not worked for him. Other than Cavani and probably Ronaldo, Bruno Fernandes has probably been a successful signing. And really, when we signed him, he wasn't a huge household name. He wasn't well known. He's probably known by the people who, you know, play a lot of football manager who, who are good at scouting. But yeah. well, like outside the Premier League, outside yeah. the Champions League. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't really known. There's, I, th I think the only household name I would probably accept in that midfield is Declan Rice. I think he would be ideal into into Ragnik's system. I don't know why, but you'd pay an absolute killing for him. You, you, and you wouldn't you wouldn't get him mid season either as well. Nah, I think that's, no, you wouldn't get him in January as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm trying to think who else there is in in world football who you could look at for that midfield, just like a. I think, like, I think it's important as well to like to say like with Rice. Mm. Obviously, we we'd love to sign him in January, but we're not got no a scooby of, of being able to sign him in January. And like, uh, I think January is such a difficult window because mm. anybody who's any good who plays for a, a top sides ain't going anywhere because the playing and you know the part of a the team who's trying to push for a title, trying to push for Europe or whatever. Mm. You're more likely to get somebody who's putting up a few trees for a mid-table team, um, mm. and sometimes it's one of the biggest transfer dealings is who you get get out the door. Mm. Um, and I, th I, I think there'll be, yeah, Ranyi might want to get one or two players in. Um, he maybe even do it the old-fashioned German way and, and sign the contract for them in, in January, but they don't actually come till the summer. Um, that's what the German clubs always seem to do. Mm. Um, maybe that's an approach he takes. Um, but I, I certainly expect it to be a case of more go out than, than come in. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. I think we'll see three or four go out um, because he'll, see, he'll be like, you're not going to be playing for me. You might as well go elsewhere and get your football. I think, like suggested Lingard, um, will probably, I think, will probably go. But yeah, I, I think... There's talks of Martial as well, isn't there? Going yeah, to Newcastle on loan until the end of the season. Yeah. And then if they stay up, buy him for 35 million. And I think that'd be a good move for Great us. Deal. Yeah. For for him, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's the money and he's the first sign. I don't signing. think he keeps them up. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no. He's the first sign of that Newcastle new era. I remember like the city had Robinho, didn't they? And they had to bring mm. in someone. Um, and for Martial for to be that, that first name, I think. I, it's quite. I can see why it'd be quite an appealing thing, especially if Newcastle are saying they're going to pump as much money in as they are. Um, yeah, I mean, it, for Martial, it seems to work. He'll be probably on well more, or if not the same money as he is at United, and more game time, probably more opportunities for goals. Like you say, Newcastle aren't bad going forward. It's their defensive stuff they need to work on. So why they'd be going for a player like Martial? is beyond me, but um, we'll see anyway, Chris, we'll wrap it up there. Um, we'll, um, 
Well, yeah, we'll wrap it up there. Um, if I don't see you before, have a great Christmas and a great and New you, Year. Mate. Yeah, you too. I mean, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we'll speak in the group chat. But if I don't see you actually on the podcast, because I think this is our last one, um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for this year. Um, no it's, been, it's been a pleasure doing the podcast. But yeah, thank you everyone who's watched as well. If there's anyone on now, thank you for watching. Uh, make sure you check out everything on the local TV, as you have done all of this year. Uh, there is stuff going out on not just the Manchester TVs, but you know, every place will have their local TV channel. You can look at Leeds, Birmingham, or Bristol, anyone like that. Um, and it's not just football content they put out either. They just put out general news topics as well, and it's all great stuff. But yeah, if... Uh, if why did I say if um, I was going to say if you haven't liked or subscribed, I think I was doing a YouTube thing. Then I, I don't know why I went into, my, uh, into a YouTube rut. Uh, but yes, thank you for watching. Yeah, I'm going to say yeah, hit the bell. No, thank you for watching, um, and we will see you all in the new year. Have a great Christmas, everyone. Great New Year. Stay safe.